Hello, our next presentation is with uh, Adam Marshall and Chris Sitzenstock of Sidewalk Labs, uh, Thomas Robinson, of founder of Lever Architecture, and myself, Greg Howes. We're all here in Portland, Oregon, in the offices of Lever Architecture in the Mass Timber Building, Albany Yard. We'll be essentially sitting around a table discussing the mass timber industry in a discussion. Thank you, everyone. I think we're, we're I'll introduce everyone here now. We'll move on. We are sitting uh, in the Lever Architecture office here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we have Thomas Robinson, the founder and lead of Lever Architecture, and then uh, Chris Sitzenstock and Adam Marshall of Sidewalk Labs. And uh, what we wanted to move on for this is just essentially a general discussion of of the, the mass timber industry and where it's at. But I'll let, if you can give a background, Chris, a bit on your, your work. Yeah, sure. You know, uh, my name is Chris, um, Director of Fabrication over at Sidewalk Labs. Um, Sidewalk Labs is a company under Google Alphabet with sort of a um, mandate for um, setting ourselves up with sort of urban innovation and making the urban realm um, a, a, like, a, like a better place in sort of all regards, whether it's Healthcare, transportation, um, like transportation, the built environment, um, sort of the whole stack there. Um, I mean, my sort of journey was that one last um, started almost five years ago now, actually, um, where I was like finishing up the America's Cup in San Francisco, got a call from someone at Google, um, kind of out of the blue, actually, and said, hey, you want to come talk about a job at, at, at uh, Google? And, and, and like I said, I took it as a, this is a strange phone call, but it'd be kind of fun to go visit Google. Um, and I kind of got peppered with a series of questions of how do we make cities, you know, faster, cheaper, greener to build, you know, and it was, it was like kind of fascinating, but like kind of halfway through, it was like, why, why do you want me? Like, you know, like, I'm not really, like, I don't actually fit this, like, I don't have a healthcare plan to make cities better. And then I got sort of a long series of questions, okay, like, I mean, like, you spent the last 25 years building yachts, you know, like, so how does that work? You know, like, you ever launch a yacht? And like, and like, does it float? Does the power work? Do, do, do like the hydraulic works? Is it, is it painted? It was like, a, you know, of course you do that. You know, like you launch the yacht and it's ready to go sailing because you're so much more efficient like in that factory. You know, and then they kind of turn the questions over like, okay, like I, right now we're sitting in a building that actually costs more than that yacht you build, took more time, and it doesn't actually go in the water and go anywhere. You know, it's like, how can this building cost more than the, 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 the yacht you build? Um, I mean, so there was actually a very, you know, um, um, you know, concerted effort to find someone who sort of built all those things in a factory off-site, actually. Um, then sort of fast forward to the future, um, I mean, we've sort of spent probably the last three years studying uh, mass timber buildings. Um, we sort of took the kind of the first step of sort of, you know, finding the best in class people out there. Um, I mean, that journey sort of took us to Switzerland uh, pretty early on. Um, I mean, we sort of partnered with a series of companies over there. So, that, you know, I'm kind of studying what the best in class was or what made them different, sort of what made them tick. You know, I mean, so I think we had a kind of a unique opportunity where step one was go cost model like a million square feet of building that got built out of a very advanced factory there. And then, you know, find out the capital costs, find out the OPEX costs, and really like use that as like our first baseline to, to sort of start tweaking that model. Um, and, then, and, and then now we're sort of, you know, turning the page into let's go execute and, you know, bring those things to life now. It's a big task. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy you were taking it out. Much work needs to be done. Yeah, yeah. No, and, 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 like, and like because the task is so large, I think that also brought us to Switzerland into that Central European mentality. Where like you meet those companies that have been around for like a hundred years, and like you realize like what they built and that and that expertise and that technology and the human capital that you know you sort of can't invent. And like it's only you know something you probably build upon, you know that like it's not something that they, that you can really have a blank sheet of paper with. Hi, um, I'm Marshall. I'm the uh, director of digital application and construction at Sidewalk Labs. Um, so also got a strange phone call. You know, uh, <laughs> hey, what do you think about coming to? To build buildings. I spent uh, 15 years working in the intersection of technology and aerospace manufacturing. 
um, and uh, decided to make the jump and, and see what can apply from, from those learnings into Sidewalk Labs and that journey that Chris just mentioned. Um, so you know, I'm working to, to um, develop and or um, you know, partner to implement technology from the architecture and design phase through our, our uh, factory and manufacturing processes into the uh, logistics and supply chain and delivery of uh, projects, um, you know, which is uh, a lot to learn from um, in that foundation of like you know, learning the best in class in Swiss. There's a lot in aerospace automotive around how to do parametric design, um, how to, how to um, disseminate information, how to use uh, reference models and, and so forth uh, to, to do model-based engineering and design across the value stream and uh, excited to, to see where we can learn from others on that journey and where we can uh, also contribute. I gave a little bit of background on my journey. Um, my, I finally convinced my father to retire his sawmill at age 82 um, this past summer. And my grandfather, until he passed away, he was 93 when he quit. And essentially, I've been a builder for 20 years. And then I recognize as a research would, we're fortunate to be here in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon and Washington, the biggest lumber producing states in the US, the biggest lumber importing and exporting country in the world, yet the growth industry is here is exporting logs, trying to be a low cost producer of a commodity product, yet we have growing housing shortages, uh, explosion and demand continues to rise, we have a constraint of some labor, so what is the best solution to build faster, better, cheaper, greener adding maximum value to an abundant, sustainable local resource, creating jobs and creating affordable housing. And to me, the best thing to do would be to use the best tools and technologies available. And after doing a lot of research, where is that most automated? And everybody ended up looking at Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. And the factories I toured in Europe, Canada, the US, when I dug deeply, like, oh, what's the system here? The software and the machines? The majority were coming from Europe, and that's how I found Stefan Schneider, my business partner. I'm like, look, this is ultimately a technology business. The best way to create jobs and to create buildings is to do it efficiently using automation, learning from other industries like automotive. And so that there's so much to do, yet the technology spreads slowly around the world. How do we bring in the best tools and processes to this market? There's more than enough work for everyone. Even when I talked with my partner, Stefan, about how many licenses, for example, of CAD work, the software we're using, there are like, I think there were over 700 in Switzerland alone. And there was hundreds of companies, what I would call the mass timber business in a country of 8 million people where only 10% of the buildings are wood framed. And here we are in the world's largest market. How do we adopt the best technologies? How do we be a part of that supply chain? And I think there's room for literally tens of thousands of companies doing this. So it isn't a problem of competition, it's a adopting and developing the best tools. So I'm excited about how much potential there is, and I think there's incredible potential here on the West Coast. I celebrate the fact that the technology industry is coming into this, the built environment, as a customer and partner. Because there's too much to build. We have a crisis and we, we need everyone. To, to, to build billions of homes. As I think it's Bill Gates who said, we need a new New York City every 30 days for the next 30 years. How do we do that? Yeah, no, I mean, to me, like, one of the amazing things about Switzerland is that there's 32 modular timber manufacturers in the country of Switzerland. And that's based on the same population as Washington State. You know, I mean, like the amount of, you know, like, you know, like massive opportunity out there for a lot of different people at different tiers is, is, is pretty incredible, actually. You know, like even Germany is about 16. A country that's probably 10 times larger, you know. I mean, I can sort of like just from that sphere out, I mean, there's a massive drop off actually. Right, so I think, I think the, the thing we need to fear least is uh competition. If we're adopting new technologies, um, and that those are efficient, it's a the big opportunity is just scaling building systems and building them because it's there are magically skilled carpenters aren't suddenly going to enter our market, we're actually losing those people. Yet demand goes up, so 
what better solution is there? And, and that's why I got into it. I was a builder. I wanted to build more better buildings. And I need a system to do that because I can't have that knowledge myself. I need to be a part of an advanced supply chain in order to do that. Yeah. What do you think, Thomas? I mean, I think one of the big challenges that we see um, is, is the whole picture, you know, the actual manufacturing and detailing and putting a building together, at least for us, is almost the, I want to say the easiest part, but it's like the most straightforward part. It's a technical challenge. And in the United States, one of the hardest things that, you know, we come across is, is you know, is the actual regulatory framework and the real estate kind of, uh, uh, complexity of politics, of real estate, of codes that overlap and contradict each other. Um, you know, I was, you know, I've been an architecture over 25 years or 30 years. And, you know, I was initially really interested in working in Europe. Um, and I, my mother's European, and I worked in Switzerland for three years doing work in the United States. Uh, or a Swiss firm there. It was really interesting to sort of see the cross pollination that happened then. And the project that we did there was the Dion Museum, which used SolidWorks in 2000 to parametrically kind of do this incredibly complex metal facade. And I'm like, we're never going to do anything that complicated again. <laughs> and then I, you know, five, six years ago, our firm was one of the winners of the US uh, Tallwood. Um, Public only competition and and Steve Marshall, who I think is on this call, was a big part of that. Uh, and during that process, you know, we spent probably a million and a half dollars doing full scale component testing of all the elements that we needed to actually get a high rise building permit in the U.S. But when I would go to like Europe and talk to engineers there, they're like, "Well, how do you get a high rise permit in Norway?" They're like, "Well, you just need two engineers." And, you know, if, if, you know, they both agree that this is a good thing, that it's pretty straightforward. That is so not the way it is here. <laughs> <laughs> it is so hard to just do the simplest things, like even just do a timber brace. You know, we still can't do that without full-scale performance component testing for that element. So it's just, we're kind of, you know, our work has been really sort of over the last five years to just, really look at design and the regulatory framework in parallel with the supply chain that's available and try to kind of land, look at those in parallel so that when we land the building, we can actually get it permitted. We have a supply chain that can actually manufacture it. And it's actually a nice building. It's a nice piece of architecture and it actually gets the budget, you know? So, that is really one of the biggest challenges we have here, honestly, is I think that is, is, it's almost a, as much a real estate regulatory framework challenge as it is a manufacturing challenge. They really are kind of in parallel. Yeah. Um, but of course, I love detailing. I love technology. I love what it can do. Uh, but I think that um, that's, the, that's still, that regulatory framework is, is really critical here. Um, and, you know, now what we were able to do five years ago with performance-based testing is now sort of memorialized to a degree in the code with the, the new IBC, tall timber regulations, but it's still a long ways to go. It's still really challenging. Yeah, no, I agree mean, you know, with like technology and the politics. Also, there's like a cultural thing. Um, I'm like, I remember like being in a large shop in Switzerland and like they were waiting for a massive shipment of CLT in like four weeks. And the vendor literally called them up and said, We can't do it. Um, you, like, you have to find someone else. It was a horrible dark day for that guy. But then, like, he called up someone else and they honored the price on a timeline where they would lose money basically on like the ethos of like, it could be us next time. So like we all have to help each other. And I mean like that's like a big part of like where things get advanced too. You know, like everyone's helping each other because everyone wants these products to be delivered. No one wants anyone to actually lose in a big way. And you know, like if everyone wins, everyone wins. I think Portland and Oregon is in a way similar, you know, and that it is a little bit more collaboration between contractors 
architects and fabricators. Uh, partially because it's, I, you know, I worked in Basel for a while and I worked in Spain and you get to know different people. There are relationships and it's like you aren't going to like, that person's going to be around in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> you, you should, you know, you have to be kind of thoughtful. You can't just, you know, you know, while we work in a market like Los Angeles, which is so large, you, you know, and some of these markets are so large, people just like, yeah, whatever, I don't care. If, if it doesn't work out, I've got way more work over here. That's sometimes not to, I just think maybe that sort of middle, middle size city sometimes allow for that internal collaboration and things actually being advanced. Uh, yeah, so it, and I think Europe definitely has that. Though I have to say, you know, working, it's changed since maybe when I worked in Europe in 2000, I think, you know, there's, Probably fewer manufacturers, I would say, maybe. There's more consolidation. I think one of the things you see in the US is like, you know, things get consolidated so quickly because of the scale into like yeah. one or two people that make this thing and they're just yeah. competing against the commodity price. Yeah. And it's hard, you know, they're like, well, you might have five different fruit wall manufacturers making the same product across Europe. You know, in the US, there might be like, Three, you know, for the entire yeah. entire country, yeah. you know, that, that makes something. So it's different. It's really a different, you know, market. Yeah, I, I think also like a lot of the technology is sort of democratizing things too. You know, I mean, like you're looking at like a small scale shop over like an, over like a central year, essentially set up like one carpenter where he had one machine and he was incredibly efficient. <laughs> you know, and it was it, it was like a really great thing of like you know someone who like sort of embrace it, you know, like the technology and the craft and then produce very large complex things in a very small space. You know, I mean, did you be like, we're, I think we're like, there's going to be like, like, you know, like large players who are going to large projects, but then like, and like seeing a lot of people who are doing a lot of different things. And yeah, that's really the drive things in a huge way as well. Yeah, and I, I've experienced my works from Finland, so I've been to numerous wood events in Finland, just, and wood has been a big part of their economy forever. Uh, traditionally more paper, but now they're doing more in buildings. But uh, going to some events there, it was interesting because the Finns were like, well, look, you've got everything. What are you missing? You're in the West Coast, it's the biggest real estate market. You got the most investors, you have the most wood. Um, you're, you have everything, you have every advantage. And I can push back on that because in, in, in a country like Finland, it's got 5.6 million people. You're one degree of separation from pretty much everyone. Yeah. And essentially the building codes don't vary that much across the country compared to look at the building code in California alone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, and you know, the, the reality is, is certain industries, there's all these special interests. And, yeah. you know, I mean, we just finished a building for Adidas, which is a hybrid of precast and cross laminated timber and blue land. You know, and, and, but the concrete industry is still, you know, like really concerned about wood taking market share, but there's still so much going on, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's just, it's, there's that stuff, that, that, that piece of it out there that is a big deal. Um, but, you know, I think, I, you know, I think it's all going to, it's amazing to see We've been doing this now for five years. This building is about five years old. It was the first domestically fabricated cross laminated timber building in the United States. It's an office building. And in the last five years, you just have like cycle labs, you have like, I don't know, six different manufacturing facilities opening up. You have universities expanding, you probably have like a couple hundred, I think they said like 600 projects in mass timber mm -hmm. nationwide, you know, potentially happening. So it's just like so much going on and we, we just are sort of scratching the surface. I almost feel like in Portland, it's like Portland's good at like microbrew and beer to make really high <laughs> quality beer. And we're really good at making good wine. And then, and then it's like, you know, the, 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 the model for Amazon's bookstore is called Pal's Books in Portland, Oregon. They were the first people to put books online. And now Amazon in Seattle is just like going to blow it up. Um, they did. And now I think what's going to happen 
is these tech companies are going to take this. Doesn't mean that we're not going to be still making really good wine in Portland and really good beer and really good food. Uh, it's just going to be a little different, but there's going to be this other piece of it that's going to be, I think, revolutionary. Uh, so it's, it, it'll, I think it's, I, I hope that the design piece, I, you know, I think there's so much discussion about, um, I teach too in school and, you know, just having a good tool doesn't mean that you can do something that's good with it. <laughs> uh, you know, just having a really great, it's like I talk to my students, I'm like, you have to have a, a purpose or an idea that is bigger than the tool behind what you're doing to actually do something of value. Uh, so I think there's a bigger issue specific to, we're very focused on equity, rural economic equity, and also equity, um, uh, social, social equity specific to technology. It's a big deal right now, especially in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, so those are all things that, and then obviously the issue of uh, global warming, the climate, those are all things that are entering into it. And it's nice to see that the, the companies are somewhat aligned and thinking that that is something that they're focused on. Yeah. You know, and, and what we're talking about too, I mean, there's a lot of variation in design. And it's amazing what wood producers can produce. You know, if I take some like the Blue Lane and do it from like the like the you know, Swatch headquarters, you know, an incredible Shigeru Bond building to the next project was refugee housing for people from Syria. You know, those largely the same people doing the same thing with a way different obviously mission to do. You know, but like in the beginning it was amazing how like, efficient both projects were actually. You know, I mean done with the same people, same technology. But isn't, doesn't that speak to the maturity of the supply chain and that you have multiple competitors that can function at that high level? I mean, even when I talk to, again, my Swiss business partner, Stefan Schneider, will talk about process and doing it, and he'll typically say, like, look, you can't be competitive in the high-end wood business in Switzerland if you're doing things the old way. Yeah. Because you're just not going to get hired because you can't play at that level. Yeah. You can't work in the day, you can't be a part of the supply chain. But it's going to take a long time for that supply chain to develop here. There's, I don't think there's a shortcut. Yeah. So there's big opportunities for those companies that are moving in that direction. But also big challenges. Why, 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 is it, why did it take so long for it to happen here? Stick what? frames, stick frames. Why? Stick. <laughs> stick frame in the United States, all you need is a, a skill saw and a nail gun, and yeah. you can build anything out of wood pretty much. You can build up to 75 feet, you know, yeah. uh, hundreds of thousands of square feet of housing. Uh, and I, I, you know, every time I, everyone's like, well, why haven't we done that? I'm just saying we have. We already have the cheapest, most efficient modular wood building system in the world, in the United States, that builds more out of wood than any other system. Yeah. And people just, it's just right under your nose. And the entire supply chain of the United States is organized and has been since 1837 yeah. around building stick frame. And it's just so hard to compete because it's like, you know, so the only modular systems you see out there that are sort of been maintained in the US are using stick frame, but just building it like they built on site in a factory. So they're slightly more efficient. Yeah. And it's just been, it's so, it's like the, I don't know, sometimes you realize it's like I dream of stick frame sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and I, I'm kind of glad to appreciate it now. I was like, you must have to, must have to like go through it to get out, go out of it. Uh, I mean, we, you see stick frame right outside here. So that's a, they're building it right now. They finished that floor, you know, in like, I don't know, like a crew of like 10, five guys finished it in like a couple days. You know, they're building a, you know, that's going to be a uh, 60,000, 70,000 square foot. So, you know, 7,000 square meter housing project, you know, so uh, it's just, it's, it's a real, it's a real obstacle.
so that it's doing something more with more innovation. No, for sure. I mean, like, I mean, like, sick frame is radically efficient, actually. No, yeah, like, I'm like, I'm like, just back to you, like, one person who carried all pieces over their shoulder. Yeah, but I'm like, I pick up truck, they can buy it, should be low, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but to me, like, there's also a bit of, like, Swiss not being emotional and very rational about things. I'm like, I remember, like, walking to the parking lot with, like, a, with, like, I'm like, I'm like the guy from the second largest Swiss GC. And I, and I asked him, like, well, I mean, I mean, they had both, like, a concrete batch plant and, like, a mass timber fabrication plant. I remember asking them, well, so why did you concrete or why did you wood? And they kind of looked at me like I was a complete idiot. I was like, well, one's cheaper and faster. And, and so we did the concrete one was cheaper and faster, and we did the wood was cheaper and faster. And we're like gonna like make the mass timber plant twice as big and the coffee plant the same. You know, and it was it wasn't like any time he barely cared actually. You know, <laughs> even if he was getting projects, he was like delivering them as quick, as cheap as possible to make the most profit. You know, and that is what drove Well one and then our, we had a, an earlier speaker was Fabian Scheuer of Design and Production, and he had worked on his watch headquarters yeah. and many other just amazing projects. And when I look at those projects, it's kind of intuitively look at that like you can't decide the framers who did that across the street and say, hey guys, do this. So it's it's, it's a technology, it's software, it's machines. It's really the only way to deliver that reliably. But there's a finite number of those amazing wood projects with massive budgets and their architectural statements around the world. So those are an obvious opportunity for mass timber, but what about in the U.S.? Where are other markets to go after at scale that you can go after? And if you're, you're not going around like, I'm going to take venture capital that wants software returns, 30% margins, and hockey stick growth. Well, I can't achieve that kind of growth or profitability as a mass timber-focused company. So that's also, I think, a big impediment to development of the supply chain. But your take on that? I mean, it's the big, I think there's just, it's a, you got to think of the big picture and then the technology is a piece of it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've been involved with a lot of folks who are really interested in modular and multiple companies. Uh, and I think the big, when I, when, when I see, because we've also done stick frame housing and we have done, you know, cross laminated timber buildings, you've done pretty much all the building types and you can sort of see um, that the issue is not necessarily the technology, the issue is the, you know, the regulatory frameworks and the kind of financial models that drive how housing is constructed and even how you know, that's the thing. It's like, even how it's like insured, like to do, to get a permit for our high rise building, we had to spend as much time on the insurance as we did on, you know, some of the other items. So it's like the, uh, that's the thing that I think is, uh, you know, the companies that we're seeing that are interesting, some of the modern companies is they're actually, they're not just, they're buying the property and then they're building, uh, then they're actually building a system around the sort of real estate structure that exists. Like here's the amount of lots that exist and let's build our system almost around a specific lot. I mean, you think of it like, uh, you think of it like uh, storage, storage companies that build storage space, right? Yeah. They have a system and then they look into the market for a lot that fits their system. Yeah. So it's a it's a really different kind of approach sometimes relative. You know, so it's those are the kinds of things we're seeing. And that's partially because it's less sophisticated in terms of fabrication, if you have more flexibility yeah. in the fabrication, it doesn't cost you more to change it, then I think that that will kind of open up more opportunities, yeah. you know, to, to, to do urban infill like you see outside. And, and, and to me, it's kind of like a step function kind of thing. Like, I don't really believe you can just take like money and just insert it in the ministry and like it magically something happens. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, like, I mean, kind of one of the more powerful things outside the labs is like set up to fix your environment. 
and it just happens to be doing that with mass timber. You know, I mean, I think like the more like, I mean, kind of like, kind of like the step function, going one step away from tech and you know, having a mission statement that's very large instead of using it as a tool to help with that is, you know, sort of the, like a powerful step you have to do, actually. I mean, I, it's so, the tech, I think the tech getting into construction is such a big deal for the United States because it just have a different attitude and they're not like uh, beaten down. <laughs> as, as the, sometimes, you know, when you're an architect and, you know, you're dealing with city and you're dealing with multiple jurisdictions and uh, even when I worked in Switzerland, I remember working with Pentac and Demeron and they're like, well, can we just talk to the code official in San Francisco about the railing design? Can we just like modify? I'm like, no, they're not going to say They don't care who you are. <laughs> this is their thing. And, you know, like, you have to work with them, you know, and you have to kind of figure out a different way to sort of say, it's like a, it's almost like uh, diplomacy in a way, yeah. you know, like, oh, yeah, we're just, you know, but it, so it was really, it was fascinating to see like that there was so much more, uh, there was a, a sort of rigidity and clarity, but there was also some inherent flexibility like you mentioned sure. about calling to the person yeah. for the delivery. So, and, 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 you know, there's been a lot of groundbreaking things. I mean, like if you have a meeting with a code official now and you meet him in this building about mass timber, oh, yeah. it's a way different conversation than five years ago. You know, this is like, you know, this is real, this is, a thing that happens. Yeah. You know, like that person probably wants to work in this office. You know, like he sees the future. Well, they want to be part of it now. I mean, to get this building permitted in the United States, it's the only building in the city of Portland permitted by the state of Oregon. It's the first <laughs> time that ever happened. So, so, the, so that's how we were able to kind of do this. And then once we got it done, they're like, oh, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll do it. We see it, it seems okay. But that's 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 the way those kinds of things happen. Yeah, as a as a technologist, I just like to echo that it's really important not to be a technology seller and come in and say iPads and apps for everyone are going to solve all problems. And so I absolutely agree. It's it's the thinking of the industry or the supply chain or the factory as a as a complex system of of people and policy and uh, processes, and not not just trying to incrementally add technology or add change to do the do the same work better. It's think about those models and how those systems work, uh, transform them to be more human-centered, more aligned with the goals that we have, and then use technology as a as a lever to how we push towards those conditions. I mean I, I had a 1920s stick built sawmill home north of Seattle that I that I uh, remodeled. And uh, it had the you know original order sheets lacquered into one of the old growth fur beams inside. And if you look those up, you know there was a grid that you could draw the house you wanted, put a two cent stamp on it in 1920, mail it in, and they would you know cut the house for you uh, for the sawmill. So that that business model is not different, right? The incentive structures and how things have grown um, around the way that construction works. You know, if we just apply technology to that, that's only a minor change. You really have to rethink about how to disrupt the overall complex system. Yeah, and companies, tech, the interesting thing is technology companies are the ones also building these new buildings out of timber. And they're, so they're also, you know, spinoffs like Sidewalk Labs. There's also other ones out there. There's one called Juno. There's others, a bunch of tech startups. I mean, we've talked to a lot of different companies, and we probably haven't necessarily, uh, you know, it's it's like the limit of what we how we want to engage because we want to actually. I think architecture, as we see it, it's like something you just want to share the technology with other people, and you're, you're building your knowledge over like thirty, almost like a thousand years of tradition. Thousands, you're sort of building on that knowledge, so it's. It's tricky, you know, whether, okay, we're going to, as soon as a, a product almost becomes like copyrighted, that detail almost dies. Like people are like, oh, I don't just change it. I don't want to, you know, so it's this weird kind of thing where people want to try to like create a, a system that is completely uh, somehow uh, 
copyrighted or restricted, you know, maybe there's a simple, simple component that is that, but if it becomes the system that it's, people are like, well, I'll just do something a little different, you know, <laughs> not necessarily, uh, you know, it has to be really amazing and efficient for that to happen. But we've seen that a lot, and you see that in structural details, you see that with architecture. It's, it's, uh, the, the open system is important in a way. Uh, and then it's really about how efficient can you be to actually execute. Yeah, sure. There's, there's a question I think we'll take. It's how much of, I assume this, Sidewalk Labs business is based on capacity to reduce costs versus technology improvements in the building systems themselves? Oh, I think it's probably equal parts of those things. You know, where I mean, like, I mean, like, well, like obviously we're you know, trying to produce buildings, you know, cheaper and faster, you know, to sort of make that building product more accessible, you know, to like, to like a lot more projects. Uh, and, and I think that kind of goes hand in hand with technology improvements to sort of make that happen. Um, so I think it's sort of, um, it goes hand in hand. It's kind of hard to separate. And I'm going to add one thing, even though we're looking across the street at uh, uh, this is a skin framed house, and we're in Portland. Um, I still think there's massive constraints out there because if you want to hire a framer right now, you've got a project, and you're here in Seattle or San Francisco or LA or Seattle. Well, kind of good luck. I mean, good luck even getting the wood, first of all. Yeah. There's a shortage of wood, and there's certainly um, a shortage of skilled framers. And I know there's more to it than buying a used Ford F 150 and nails as a nail <laughs> compressor, <laughs> but it's not that simple. <laughs> So I, I'm just maybe I drink too much of the Kool Aid, but I think there's there's a lot of room for development systems. There, I mean, there is, and I, I, you know, like, but I think what like we're doing, uh, we just started construction on a, a version of this where we're using mass plywood for the flooring, and it's a hybrid of metal studs, so it's a mixed system, and then it also has PT. And, but the funny thing is, so much is driven by regulation. So we need a 15 foot clear floor to get an extra five feet of height. So that pushes us into a PT slab. So you can have the beams yeah. included in the code. So then we have that. And then we're using the mass plywood as formwork. And then above that, we're doing a hybrid of mass plywood and metal studs on top of two floors of post tension concrete. Yeah. So it's just like about so much of this stuff is driven sometimes by, you know, technically we could do it all out of wood. Yeah. But we have fire ratings and all these sort of specific regulatory things that are weird that drive construction. Um, and we, I know that's, I get kind of keep coming back to that, but uh, it's, uh, you know, I think for us, it's like each time we do a project, we're like, where can we slip in that chunk of innovation? Yeah, sure. And that is going to then, people are like, oh, they did that. Now we can do this. Down the street here, another architect, uh, Wector Architecture is doing an all CLT um, office with his house on top, and it's and it's all sheer. It's all sheer. Yeah. There's no. It's all the, the, the all the floor walls, all the floors are all CLT. So it's a really interesting project. But the design of it is driven by the fact that in the United States we don't accept in the size of the country that we're in. The sheer values that are probably how the actual material performs. Yeah. So he has massive amounts of shear walls, mm -hmm. so he can actually make the thing work structurally. Yeah, no, and, and, and like a part of the value of like Kid of Park's mentality is like co compliance, actually. Yeah. You know, like, because I mean, like, it works something like the solid system, it has to meet the fire test, it has to meet the performance test, because like that can't go on to the project or to you. Yeah, you know, because like, there's simply not the cost structure or the time structure here to really make that happen and to like do that innovation. Yeah, you know, I mean, to where, to where it's less about like constraining your copywriting, it's almost more like here's the system you can. Yeah. Well, uh, the, we're going to keep on the schedule, so we'll move, we'll continue this kind of conversation on the panel. But let's move to Daryl Patterson. We have a blend lease um, on his presentation and the perspective of a company the size of Lend Lease.